Hi, this is our SAT vocabulary list number 28. Please take Cornell notes, write down the word, the part of speech, the definition, and any of the examples that I say or that you think of while you're watching the video that will help you to remember these words. And remember, you can pause the video at any time if I'm talking too fast. The first word is allay. And to allay is a verb. It means to calm the violence of something or to reduce. That means to like lessen or lower the intensity of something. So a lot of times people will take uh, Advil to allay a headache or to reduce the pain from an injury that they're experiencing. Uh, so it's to calm the violence of something, reduce the intensity of something. And oftentimes when little kids are at the beach, they're a little bit scared of the intensity of the waves and they might be feeling kind of a, an intensity of emotion, maybe fear. And so a parent might grab their child's hand and hold it or give them a little squeeze to allay whatever fears that child might be having about their first surfing lesson or going into the ocean. Austere describes something or someone that is severely simple, unadorned. And unadorned means it doesn't have any um, adornments, any, so when you think of a person who's unadorned, they're very, they're wearing something very simple. They don't have things like earrings would be adornments. Jewelry is adornments. If you have glitter on your shirt, that would be an adornment, right? And so when you think of like the stereotypical austere teacher, that's a teacher, I think of it as a, a woman, kind of middle-aged, she's got glasses, a tight bun, maybe a long ankle length wool skirt, very sensible shoes. That, that to me describes a very austere looking school teacher, kind of from the past, that very stereotypical vision of an austere stool, a school teacher. A lot of times when I'm watching Downton Abbey, a show that I enjoy, uh, a lot of the clothes can feel very austere. They're very, they, not necessarily of the, the wealthy people, but of the people working in the, in the Abbey, right? They, they tend to wear very simple clothes, very practical clothes. Um, and oftentimes someone who is austere, and this would be a good example of that austere school teacher I was describing, um, a lot of times someone who is described as austere or dresses in this very simple way is kind of associated with being very serious, solemn, very practical. Number three is credulous. And when I think of the word credulous, I think of gullible, someone who's gullible, right? They're easily deceived. And you might remember the other, the antonym for this word, which is incredulous. And if you're described as incredulous, you're the exact opposite. Opposite. You tend not to believe things. You tend to be very skeptical. Remember, I-N, by just putting that, that at the beginning of a word, means the opposite. So credulous is someone who's easily deceived, easily gullible. Maybe someone who would watch a card trick and feel like, oh my gosh, it's actually magic, right? Someone who would believe that might be described as credulous. Eradicate. To eradicate is to get rid of, to remove, to destroy thoroughly. And so a great example of, you know, something that we've tried to eradicate as actually a global community are some of the diseases like polio, for example. Vaccines have attempted to eradicate things like polio, smallpox, so that they don't exist. It hasn't been completely effective, but a lot of those diseases are extremely rare now. Um, you could also think of something like weed killer. Weed killer is supposed to eradicate, to thoroughly destroy weeds. And the word eradicate actually comes from a Latin word that means to root out, to root out. The next word is imminent, and imminent describes something that is dangerously close at hand. It's impending. It's about to happen. I just finished a book and in the book, it was called A Fault in Our Stars, the main character, Hazel, has cancer. She's terminal, which means she's going to die. So the entire book, you feel like this character's death is imminent. It is dangerously close. It's hanging over our heads. Every page we turn in this book, we feel like, is Hazel going to die? Because she has this cancer that is terminal and she's, she's going to die. It's just a matter of when. So it feels very imminent. The next word is insurgent. 
And an insurgent is a noun. It's a person who takes part in a forcible opposition, so some kind of rebellion, against the constituted authorities, so the people in power of a place. So if you're a person rebelling against the established authority, maybe a, an established government, you are an insurgent. And Sorry for all of the teen lit <laughs> kind of references, but um, one of the trilogies I just finished was the Divergent trilogy, and the second book in that trilogy is Insurgent. Um, and ironically, uh, the boy from In the Fault in Our Stars, his name is Gus or Augustus, he actually loves a video game that is called Counter Insurgency. Um, and so we have this word keep popping up. But the Insurgent book, the second book, is all about this character Triss and her friends from the original Divergent book, and they're fighting against the established law, right? They are the insurgents in this book. Number seven is mannerism. And mannerism is a noun. It's a constant or excessive adherence to doing things a particular way. And I apologize, this SAT definition is not fantastic. Um, but a mannerism, think of it as a habitual or characteristic manner or way in which someone does something. And oftentimes, mannerisms are kind of unique to people. They have different mannerisms. So as a teacher, I definitely have kind of quirky mannerisms that I know my students like to point out, um, and I think we all have them. So to think about mannerisms is a habitual kind of habit or characteristic way of doing something. So when I think about my students, some of my students also have mannerisms that irk me. For example, clicking their pens when they're thinking or relaxing or not paying attention or leaning back in their chairs, which slowly breaks them. These are all mannerisms that I don't understand. And there's a show on USA called Monk, which is all about Adrian Monk, who has this quirky, all these quirky mannerisms. So imagine getting a bowl full of jelly beans and not being able to eat them until you've sorted out for all the colors to be separated. Um, and so that's kind of a quirky mannerism. Eight is opaque, and opaque is the opposite of transparent, which was one of our previous words. So opaque describes something that is impervious to light. It's something that does not allow light to pass through. So um, transparent it allows light to, trans to, to, to flow through. Um, but something that's opaque stops the light. The light cannot go through it. And so a good example are something like blackout blinds. So we have family in Finland and during parts of the year, it is light until like the middle of the night. And so they have to use blackout blinds to literally black out their windows so that the light it cannot come through. And the blackout blinds are completely opaque. When I have been working and presenting in Alaska, they also use blackout blinds during the summer so that you can go to sleep at a reasonable hour. Otherwise, there would be sunlight flooding through your window very, very late into the night. Nine is Q. And you just have to remember that it's pronounced Q because you have that extra U-E on the end. It's easy to mess up the spelling, so just make a mental note the way this is spelled. And a Q is a line of people waiting to get somewhere, waiting to be admitted into something. So um, the first time I actually heard this word was when I was in Ireland and we were, I was there with a friend and we were trying to get into a, a concert and they kept yelling, queue up, queue up, which basically meant line up, right? Create a line of people so that we can admit you. So just to queue up means to line up um, a bunch of people standing to get in somewhere. 10 is revert. And revert means, it's a verb, it means to go back to a previous state or position or way of being, to return 
or to turn back to. Sometimes um, people will, will go back from a habit or a practice and revert, right? So maybe you, you know, you're a teenager and you decided uh, to give up religion, the religion that your parents believe or that you've been kind of practicing your whole life. But then as an adult, you kind of revert back to that, those former beliefs, right? So just to go back to a previous state. 11 is stagnant, and this is a word that means not flowing. Often it's used to describe water, like a pool of water that has no, no new water flowing in and no old water flowing out. Um, so sometimes if a river is really slow, the flow is not, it's not really flowing very much, the water can be described as stagnant. Um, but stagnant can also be used to describe other things besides just water that's kind of staying in one place. Um, you know, if you're having a discussion and, you know, you're it's kind of lagging. People have shared ideas, but, you know, there's not this new influx of ideas and energy. Oftentimes, a discussion can be described as stagnant. But a lot of you guys will probably remember that when we started the year, we read Of Mice and Men. And in the novel Of Mice and Men, one of the opening scenes is really with Lenny uh, dipping his hand into this water and taking big gulps. And George reprimands him and yells at him and says, Lenny, you should never drink from water water that's not moving. Don't drink stagnant water because it, oftentimes it has bacteria and um, it's not as clean as water that is flowing. Twelve is tenacious. And someone who's described as tenacious has tenacity, which is the noun form of this word. But if you're ten tenacious, you're persistent, you're stubborn, you hold strong. And the, the actual definition, one of the, the more common definitions is to hold fast, to be characterized by keeping kind of a firm grip on something. And so as we're coming into the end of the school year, thinking about t being tenacious, some of my favorite students are really tenacious. Like this is a hard time of year. You have so much going on and it's those kids that are persistent. They work hard. They keep their nose down. They, they work until the very end of the school year, giving their absolute best. Those are my, my like tenacious students, and I'm always so impressed with those kids because I know it is a challenging time of year, and it really does take almost a, a persistent mental strength and stubbornness. Um, my daughter has kind of a tenacious memory. That's how I think of her. She remembers every single thing that I say, which can be both a blessing and a bit of a curse. And then you think of rock climbers having a, a hold, a, a good hold on something, uh, you know, that, that persistence, that stubbornness to make it up a really challenging mountain to climb it um, definitely requires kind of a tenacious personality. Vehement, and we had the adverb form of this. Uh, the adverb form has the L-Y, vehemently. But vehement describes anything that is very eager or urgent. So uh, synonyms for vehement might be zealous or ardent or impassioned, right? Um, and it comes from the Latin word meaning violent or forceful. And so some people have vehement uh, have a vehement desire for peace, kind of this urgent, very eager desire to create peace in the world. I have a vehement enthusiasm for Shakespeare. When we are reading a Shakespeare play, I get super excited, um, almost so that it can be a little bit, I think, scary for my students. And then you have animals who some of them have just these one track minds. Uh, they are very vehement when they, they, they want their ball to be thrown, right? So those are all examples of vehement. Malice. Malice, again, it starts with M-A-L, which root word means bad. And malice is a noun, and it's the desire to inflict harm or suffering on another. So, you know, that, that like wicked almost desire to hurt someone else is malice. And so I got this picture of this guy who's definitely, um, he has a face full of malice. He looks like he wants to hurt someone. He's literally going to punch someone. And our last word is reparation. And reparation is a noun, and it means the making of amends to amend something to fix it for a wrong or an injury done. And the most common use of the word reparation, or, or maybe the most common way you'll hear it, is to pay when one country 
uh, if countries have been at war, one country may have to pay literally money to another country for the loss suffered during the war. So when we talked about during our Holocaust unit with uh, Elie Wiesel's night, we talked about, okay, what set the stage for World War II and this, this kind of um, rise to power that happened in Germany with Hitler? And we talked about how World War I ended, the Germans had to pay reparations, they had to pay all this money, their economy went into a depression um, because they had to give money to the other countries who had suffered losses. And it was really that that it, one of the, that created one of the factors that led to kind of the the beginning of World War II. So reparations, when one country has to pay for you know the damage and ca caused by you know a war or a conflict, um, and then reparations, you know, it could be a, a more informal use of the word. We're really you're just trying to make amends for something that you've done that's wrong or that's injured someone else.